Today, we have three um, folks to talk about FEMA risk rating. So we're, we're very FEMA oriented today in our discussion. Um, I believe uh, um, Shanna's going to kick it off and Brian and Velma are also on the call and there they are setting up their PowerPoint. So we will turn it over to, to uh, them to talk about the FEMA uh, risk rating 2.0. And there will be a, a point where we'll, we'll have the presentation in and we'll do a discussion. Um, feel free to start putting your questions in the chat and I'm going to help them out by watching the chat uh, if you have questions or um, anything like that. And if I mispronounce anybody's name wrong, I'm very sorry. <laughs> no worries. Thank you so much for the introduction. And um, I just want to say um, I really appreciate this opportunity. I also really appreciate the opportunity to present um, with Velma Smith from Pew. She kind of jumped in at the last minute, and I, I really thought that this discussion warranted um, some robustness, and uh, Velma's been working on this for quite some time. So she and I are going to give you um, an overview of risk rating 2.0. Um, Velma's going to dig in a little bit more to the fundamentals, and then I'm going to bring in some of the recent analysis that UCS has done on uh, thinking about whether this is truly, in fact, equity in action. And then we really want to save quite a bit of time for the uh, question and answers and, and have all of us together um, in a discussion so we can hear everybody's uh, questions and answers. So um, what we both uh, recognize, and I think you may recognize as well, is that risk rating 2.0 is really the most significant update to the National Flood Insurance Program as far as pricing methods in decades. So, um, you know, we um, what, what both of our organizations have been supportive in this effort um, and in this initiative, and we wanted to give you a quick overview, as I said, um, from the viewpoint of non-actuaries. You know, insurance can be quite uh, detailed and complicated. So this is coming from the science and policy type experts uh, like yourselves. So I think you'll um, follow along quite well. And um, at the, the bottom line is, is risk rating 2.0 is um, a mix of new and old. Um, it's been in works for several years. And um, well, just as I said, it's been the most significant update to the program, program in many years. Long and the short of it is, why we're so excited about this is that it's trading in this type of uh, methodology and uh, science from the 1980s to um, something brand new. So it's like trading in your old station wagon from the 80s to something more modern uh, based on science. And that's what brings so much excitement about it. Um, but there are also other questions that we're going to dig into. Um, some of you on this call may not remember those old station wagons, but <laughs> trust me, we some of us spend quite a bit of time in the back of those uh, station wagons. So what is it? It's a mixture of old and new. Um, on, so on the one hand, it's it's quite a new it's quite business as usual in the sense that FEMA is going to continue to make announcements on the new rates generally every spring. And um, give today um, in this this uh, new version of risk rating 2.0, um, they've done it in phases. So they made um, an announcement last April. And they phased in the new policies uh, in uh, the fall of last year. And these um, prices for the new policies will just, prices will be just for new policies. And then the second phase of this will be implementing risk rating 2.0 for the renewals. And that'll be, begin in the spring of 2022. So um, one of the, the good news is about this uh, program is that um, you'll see at the bottom line there um, a, um, these colored boxes, and this is uh, based on FEMA. And what we found is that, um, or what FEMA finds is that about 23% of the folks are going to see a price cut in their insurance rates. Um, so this is, um, so this, <laughs> So this should mean like everybody is happy, right? No, of course, not everybody is happy with this, but 66% of the folks will see um, 
some rate of increase, roughly zero to ten dollars in premium uh, increases per month, and so that's um, pretty much the majority. And then the other half will see, or the other percent, um, we'll see on average a ten to twenty dollar month uh, increase. So the um, the actual the new rating system will actually give roughly twenty three percent of the policyholders a price cut. Um, I'm sorry, I ran through that really quickly, but I'm going to hand it over to Velma and I'll hold on to the slides and let Velma uh, take this over. Okay, thanks, Shauna. And um, as Shauna said, right. she gave you the basics. And what I'm going to do is attempt to very quickly compare the factors in, in the legacy rating system to those in risk rating 2.0. Um, and I start by noting that unless you've been an avid reader, and some of you may have been, of the annual actuarial rate reviews, um, along you, along with most other non-actuaries, including me, didn't fully understand the black box that was the old rating system. Um, and now we have a new black box. But suffice it to say that old black box was state-of-the-art when it was created in the early days of the program when private insurers couldn't figure out how to price flood insurance. It was simplistic by design and it relied very heavily on one thing, um, the flood maps and the calculation of that statistically derived 1% annual chance floodplain. If we move on and looking beyond the zone, uh, the next slide, under, under the old system, uh, can we move the slides, Shauna? Ah, thanks, okay. So under the old system, the flood map that I'm sure everybody's familiar with and its depiction of that so-called 100-year floodplain, no matter how old or how outdated that map was, was central to price. Prices were based on the, that single imaginary flood and the placement of a structure in relation to that flood, ignoring multiple smaller floods that might uh, occur more frequently or bigger catastrophic floods that might have lower probability, but not zero probability. In relying on that in and out of the flood zone, pricing also ignored flood events that didn't involve riverbank overflows or coastal storms, since that's what the 100 year flood is designed to look at. The flood risk associated with major rainfall events in urban areas, for example, were essentially out of the picture. On the ground changes, say in erosion or subsidence that might've occurred since the last map update were also ignored. Next slide. But so, but risk rating 2.0 really recognizes that there are many types of floods and many factors at play. So, it, and it takes what we've learned about flooding, the advances in cat modeling, the studies of erosion, looking at how loss of pervious landscapes can be, uh, can impact flooding, information on the functioning of levees, the capacity of LIDAR, all those things and more, many factors, it combines all of that together to give a truer picture of risk. Now, the documentation behind the pricing is pretty detailed and complicated and available on FEMA's website. Um, you know, but again, the ultimate numbers are derived for prices are derived now, not from simple tables and spreadsheets, but multiple models and data sets that FEMA has been working on created, assessed, evaluated, calibrated over a matter of several years. And you know, some people are finding this complexity frustrating, but we believe it actually allows for a more nuanced and realistic assessment of risk. Now, let me, I, I put on here a number of the factors um, that we've talked about. And at the bottom, you'll see replacement cost value. Let me hone on that in on that one for a minute because I think it relates to fairness on the next slide here. 
if we go back, if we go back to that pricing bar that Shauna showed you, we're reminded that under risk rating 2.0, some people are going to get a break um, that they wouldn't get under the old system. FEMA can't tell us who they are, um, but they have shared data that show, shows many policyholders on that green end of the, the bar, maybe those with more modest homes. Um, and I think Shauna's data may back some of this up. Under the legacy system, insurance is priced without regard to how much it has, actually costs to repair your home. So even if a million dollar beach house and a modest little bungalow have similar risk for being flooded, the legacy pricing system in partially discriminated against that bungalow. When the bungalow takes on water, it would likely require the full out destruction of the home to trigger the max NFIP payout of 250,000. But for that mansion, the damage story is different. Even a smaller flood could require a full payout. And those smaller floods to the big house, to the big pricey house might occur a lot more often. That old approach, says FEMA, resulted in lower people in lower value homes paying two to three times what they should be. And people with half a million dollar or million dollar homes paying half or even only a quarter of what they should. So if you think about it this way, it's we none of us would think it's unreasonable for the guy driving the brand new Tesla to be paying more. Hey, what's going on? Oh, so, okay. Paying more in um, car insurance than the guy driving the, the old model Kia. So we don't think it should be different for flood insurance. Um, let's move to the next one. Okay, so I'm gonna stay on this for a, a minute again and show you a cart that ch chart that's a little complicated and doesn't tell you all you probably wanna know, um, but it's based on a FEMA presentation. So you can see a little bit better how the system differs in terms of who pays what. Red in here, on here is the legacy system. Blue is risk rating 2.0. The height of the bars um, relates to the average replacement cost value, uh, not the number of properties in that group. The horizontal axis shows the rate changes for the 2022 insurance year, largely in $20 increments. But let's focus on the ends of this chart. On the left, you see that under the old system, there is no red bar, no one gets a decrease. But under the new system, there is a blue bar, there are decreases, and that group has an average uh, replacement cost value of just under 400,000. The far right shows those with increases that are pretty hefty, uh, more than $100 per month. If you, if you had run the old system, there would be 45,000 policyholders seeing that kind of increase. And those for, that group of 45,000 would have an average replacement cost value under 400,000. But under risk rating 2.0, the, um, there's only 3,200 existing policyholders that will see those big jumps. And of those that do, they have an average RCV value of more than a million dollars. Large increases for sure, but for a small minority and largely for high value homes. Next one, Shauna. Okay, so can I tell you exactly where rate changes will fall? Well, no, not really, but I can help you get a better general sense because the folks at FEMA released uh, a set of spreadsheets with data on decreases and increases and to protect privacy, they aggregated by zip code and county. Um, they broke out all the changes and in increments of $10. Now, I looked at those, Pew looked at those massive spreadsheets and, set, and immediately we saw the need for maps. So what we did was partner with the Association of State Floodplain Managers to create a set of interactive maps. 
they let you see where the decreases and increases fall on a, a zip code scale. You can look at the data filtered to give you all NFIP policies, including those for commercial and multifamily, or you can look at it if you wanna just look at single family. Um, I'll show you the, um, the next slide. You can look at a particular, you can filter for a particular state and dig into some of the detailed data. Um, for example, this one shows, we're showing Michigan, as you can see, and you see there in the upper right that more than 53% of single family po home policy holders in Michigan will see a decrease under risk rating. You can use the tabs at the bottom and you can look at where the, the increases will fall as well. Next slide. And when you can also zoom in and get a little more granular on looking at how many policies in a particular zip code. This one, we're looking at, at an Eastern portion of Louisiana there um, along the Mississippi River next to Mississippi. Uh, the good guys, uh, there's a wonderful GIS guru at ASFPM. And he, so he packed the maps with plenty of interactivity and lots of explanatory material. And we were really happy to collaborate with them because we think it gives the floodplain managers and others an ability to take a look at those areas that might need some special review. They, they might be able to tell by looking at these maps, those areas where you know, maybe people can lower both their insurance rate and their risk by elevating mechanicals, installing flood vents, uh, areas where drainage solutions may be, you know, doable and, and helpful. And they can also look and find maybe areas of high poverty or social vulnerability that indicate maybe there's a need for some affordability program attached to this, something that both Shauna's organization and mine would certainly support. So we, you can look, there's three separate sites. I've given you the URL so you can look at these maps yourself. Finally, one last slide. Um, I just want, I have to note, unless you, um, anybody think otherwise, flood maps are not going away. They're no longer key to rate making, um, but they'll still be used to determine who has to buy insurance and how communities should manage floodplains. And with that, I'm gonna hush up and hand it back to Shauna. Excellent, thank you so much, Velma. Um, this uh, next a few set of slides um, is going to showcase some of the recent analysis actually from last year that uh, my colleagues at UCS and I uh, conducted and I think it'll uh, complement what uh, Velma has just spoken about as far as what the risk uh, rating 2.0 data show. Um, so what we really wanted to do is, oh, and let me just mention their names. So um, our senior climate scientist, Christy Dahl, um, did the uh, programming. And then this was also um, uh, with uh, Juan de Bar Barreto, who's our uh, senior socioeconomic uh, person here at UCS. And so what we really wanted to understand is, is risk rating 2.0 really equity in action? Um, and so the, what we wanted to find out is, um, you know, this question here, will communities with higher uh, markers of socioeconomic vulnerability see their premiums decrease to a greater extent than the zip codes with less vulnerable populations? So we used FEMA's data on how premiums are expected to change within a community and coupled it with census data on things like race, ethnicity, poverty, and home values. So what we would expect if risk rating 2.0 is really equity in action, we would expect that the socioeconomically vulnerable communities would see their premiums decrease to a greater extent than the communities with less vulnerable populations, or that fewer premiums would increase in socioeconomically vulnerable communities than in less vulnerable communities. So um, I put this cartoon in here because over the last years, you know, we've seen that science has become political and unfortunately risk rating 2.0 hasn't escaped the um, 
politics of this. So I think um, if I can speak for Velma and our organization, we really wanted to bring the science to this to really see what it means. So um, our methods were pretty straightforward. As I said, we mapped the zip code level data from FEMA along with the census data and then evaluated the statistical correlation between the two. We also calculated the uh, basic statistics of socioeconomic variables, both nationally and by state. And then we binned the data by the percent of policies in each zip code that would see premiums increase or decrease. So our findings. Um, <laughs> the main takeaway here is that there is really no resoundingly clear answer on whether risk rating 2.0 will actually improve equity. So when we think of equity, FEMA is not using it in the way that the common understanding of equity is, right? Um, it's really more speaking to the fair pricing of flood risk. Um, but the results are mixed. We found that um, there were some interesting things and we um, basically identified the need for more localized analysis, um, which I think uh, Velma's uh, data shows as well. So let me just explain this uh, map before I go into the first finding. Um, what you'll notice here is that there's a small key at the bottom. So I kind of want to take some time to make sure um, we're all on the same page because it's a little complicated. But um, when you look at what we looked at here is the percent of policies with any level of premium decrease. So what we're seeing here is from red, orange, yellow, green to dark green um, are different scales of that. So the red, which I wanna focus your attention to to just give you a, some sense of this map is basically the, the quote unquote worst off areas. That means it indicates the percent of policies with decreased premiums that are lower than the national mean. So did you guys get that? So the red is the percent of policies with decreased premiums that are lower than the national mean. So you can see that here. So our first finding is that on average, policies will see premium decreases, um, policies that will see premium decreases are in zip codes with larger percentages of Hispanics and African-Americans. So that's um, good news, right? So we found that communities where most policyholders will see a decrease in their premiums tend to have that higher proportion of Hispanic and African-American residents and lower percentages of white residents than communities where relatively few policyholders will see a decrease. So that's our first finding. Um, and while these differences aren't enormous and there's no way of telling which policyholders in a given zip code will experience those decreases, this does suggest decreases in premiums will happen in zip codes with larger percentages of Hispanics and African-Americans. Our second finding, staying with the same map, is at the national level, there are no statistically significant relationships between poverty or home value variables. And the percent of all policies that will see increases or and the percent of all policies that will see increases or decreases in, in premiums. So again, we're seeing sort of more of the um, change in the, the um, types of, uh, you know, Hispanics and, and African Americans, but when it comes to home value, not seeing as much. So at the national level, the policyholders in zip codes with the higher rates of poverty or lower home values are no more or less likely to see changes in their flood insurance premiums than policies in the wealthier zip code areas. And there are no indicators to suggest that the frequency of a policy premium increases changes with the socioeconomic status changes. And then finally, our third finding is that at the national level analysis, the national level analysis masks a high degree of local variability in the concentration of policies with premium increases and decreases. So the more localized, for example, the state or county analysis is needed to understand how these changes in premiums relate to, relate to the variety across different markers or socioeconomic well-being. So just to say that the, the, there's a high uh, pattern of variability um, across uh, the nation, as you can see here with this map, um, the pattern uh, in 
we can look at different zip codes in different areas. And if we look at the Gulf Coast, for example, there are a lar larger share of premium increases compared to the national average. So you may um, guess why that is. Um, I think Velma and I may suggest that it's due to the higher risk. Um, but uh, with that, um, there was a quick overview of our findings and we'd love to take some questions. So thank you very much. Didn't wanna waste time. So I know there is a chat, um, which I need to open. So we can start looking at, I think we had somebody that was going to moderate the chat. Somebody's on mute. Okay, maybe we can do it ourselves, Velma. <laughs> okay. Um, sure, the first question up there is, will these cuts and decrease, degrees of increase remain the same over the next five to 10 years or increase more in coming years? Well, the reality is, it's all over the place because as most of you as adaptation professionals know, you know, um, flood risk is, is variable and it's changing all the time. So in some places, the, the increases will continue. Um, in some places, um, you know, they, they may be stay pretty stable. And in some places where you have projects to uh, address the flooding risk, you know, prices could even go down. Now, Brian um, filled me in a chat that, um, that um, FEMA has run some numbers that they've thrown out and they say that uh, about a quarter of the policyholders are actually reaching their, their final, you know, worst uh, rate based on conditions today um, in that first year, but that for some other property holders, policy holders, it, it'll take, uh, you know, I guess half of them, it'll take five years for them to get to their full, full risk rate. Um, and, and some even longer, 10 years and longer. So let's see. And uh, one thing I just wanted to add is that I don't think either of us mentioned, but um, these aren't when the, the rates that are going into place are not full risk rates yet. It's actually gonna take quite some time to get them to full risk rates. So I don't remember what the, uh, Velma, you're on mute, what the timing is, but I think it's like half of the um, rates will go, will be um, full risk in 10 years or, or something like that. Is that right, Velma? Um, yeah, no, I'm sorry, I was trying. <laughs> <I>, um... <laughs> Uh, it, it's a mixed bag. Um, some people will hit that rate um, now, okay. and some people it, it will take longer. Um, and I think FEMA's data was, I think the data they shared was that a quarter of them will hit their full risk rate the first year. But, but you know, again, as adaptation professionals, we all understand that risks are changing. So, you know, when they relook at the the risk in certain areas next year when they rerun those elevation that elevation data may be different the sea level rise the erosion data the subsidence information it could be different so that you know it's repriced every year mm -hmm. okay I'll, I'll take i'll read the next question is little change by uh, josh foster uh, is little change in home value from flood rate reductions because home value is determined by many more factors than just flood vulnerability. Uh, I think that's a yes. <laughs> um, little change, I'm, I guess I'm not totally clear in what yeah, I, that- I'm not clear on the question either, but I think Josh, it's just- do you wanna unmute and ask your yeah, question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. I'm just thinking that you didn't see a correlation between change in home value and lower rates. So, what that says to me is that if you live in an area where your home value is already depressed, even if your rate goes down, meaning it's a more accurate reflection of risk, it may or may not improve the value of your home because home value is determined by a lot of other factors. Um, but I put one caveat, caveat in that was... Uh, I'll just, if I could jump in yeah. while you're, um, I, I think that what our team might say is that we, we really need to get to the localized results. So yeah. it's possible that um, at the zip code level, it's still, you've got maybe 
you're just masking, you know, some of the, the data. So, uh, you know, I don't think FEMA is willing, going to go any more detail than the zip code level because of, you know, there are just so many um, implications they could get sued perhaps. And, and that, that's what I would assume. I mean, if you look hyper locally, you'll see more differences because if you're going to be heavily impacted in a particular area by really bad floods very frequently, then your home value is probably going to go down given the impact. But if you have lower rates, it might allow you to stay, which will increase the value of your home. So it's, a, <laughs> it's like it's more determined very locally rather than the aggregate, as you said. So, Right. Okay. And, and also, people should remember that we don't know that the FEMA data tells us the amount of the increase or the decrease, but mm -hmm. we don't know what they're paying now. Yeah. So, exactly. and, you know, and we know, and we don't know who within that zip code is, is actually the one that has the policy and, gotcha. you know, past, past information shows that clearly um, a lot of people of low income don't buy flood insurance uh -huh. so, yep. and they don't have it. So I'll just add, I, I think FEMA's uh, data is pretty detailed. So, if, you know, you could go back and, and check, we could all go back and check and see how that home value is calculated. But I, I just don't remember all the different variables. Okay, so um, Thanks. What is, of course, what, what about the complete lack of rate reductions for retrofit or elevation or dry proofing? This is by Roderick Scott. I think um, that's going to change. Uh, uh, with the rate risk rating 2.0, um, as as Velma was was talking about. Well, what... oh, okay. Yeah, I I, I I don't think you can say that there's a lack of rate reduction for uh, you know your elevation is still still going to be important, uh, but there's a variety of other factors that are also important. So that still is important. Dry flood proofing. The issue has always been, you know, uh, dry flood proofing for commercial versus residential. So I, I think, I think there's more to the story on that one. Can I jump in? Uh, this is Rod. Can I jump in on that? Sure. Okay. Uh, Roderick Scott, the uh, board chairman of the uh, Flood Mitigation Industry Association. So, uh, you know, we're, we're facing three to four million pre-firm buildings in the flood zones in the U.S. that have not been uh, either elevated or dry flood proof. They're the original pre-flood map buildings, high flood risk, and they're the ones that always flood. Our new buildings rarely flood because if they put some freeboard on top of them, they're, they're pretty good, at least at the coast for a while. We all know that the ocean's coming. But the riverine systems that use the freeboard uh, have really proven their value uh, of having that additional elevation. Um, what we are finding, and there's a big study going on right now nationwide, ASFPM and our flood mitigation industry, is um, we are finding that there is only a $100 difference, roughly run $100, $200 difference between elevating your pre-flood map home and not elevating it. And so that was what we used as the basis for all the cost benefit and the selling is the reduction in the damages and the, um, and the stabilization of values as these insurance rates go up. Because you know if you're four feet below, the old legacy rate was gonna be $9,500 a year for a 250K policy. Uh, and that's undoable, that's unmanageable. And we're looking at a, you know, the banks are starting to shiver because they're talking about value decreases in millions of buildings, which will then translate into property tax reductions in communities and not, not able to qualify for the Corps of Engineers large project cost benefits because you're losing property values in there. And, and that's a whole nother conversation with property values and core projects. But um, we're, we're shocked. We, we are just flabbergasted. FEMA won't talk about it. They dance around it. And we're calling for a timeout on the deployment April 1st, because what we're seeing is it's gonna be another bigger waters. It's gonna be a, a real estate disaster. It's uh, banks and the, and the realtors are gonna come back to Congress and go, oh my God, what have you done? And why do we have to human cause disasters like this? Why can't we just put it on pause now that we've discovered this real data? Because we're getting quotes for these buildings. And it's like, 
they elevated their insurance went from 5,000 to 500 a year. They're plus two or plus three. And all of a sudden they're going back up to within a hundred dollars of where they were if they would have never elevated. So there's something fundamentally wrong in the algorithms. And, and so we're just saying you got to time out for the deployment so that we don't cause pain and heartache and anxiety and all of the trauma that we saw with bigger waters. Uh, yeah, because I, we've we found a problem. <laughs> I, I do think, Rod, let's, we, we've got a lot of questions, so we've got to keep moving. But I do think we, we have to recognize there's a differential between, you know, I mean, some some of these problems are, you know, are being portrayed as an insu- a problem brought about by a new insurance rate, when in reality, it's a problem from old construction and from from climate change you know with the we're seeing the, some of these you know hard cases are showing us the result what what the future is so i do think that's again why some of this information points to where we need to prioritize mitigation efforts um elevation efforts buyout efforts you know new investments in in flood uh protection so i really it, wish it, you guys would work stuff. with us so, on this stuff so I, i'm i'm I think bummed we out need that to... you won't work with us so, so if i can just jump in we are at our time for today unfortunately um but i know that we have a lot of questions still in the chat so i'm wondering if velma shauna brian if i collect these into a google doc if you wouldn't mind putting some responses to the questions we weren't able to answer today. Absolutely, because there's a lot of good questions. Love to. Okay, great. I will get that ready and send that over to you. And in our meeting follow-up, I'll include um, those responses from our presenters today. So if anyone has some last questions, make sure to put them in the chat and I'll get them over to our speakers. Um, And I I could just add quickly, I mean, I I think, you know, we we both agree that we, you know, this isn't just a FEMA question. We also need We've got like one and a half reauthorizations at NPIP. I think it's like a- Shauna, your audio is fading in and out. And now you're- I'm muted. sorry. We, I think we both agree that we need an affordability program and that's on Congress. So thanks. And so in their follow-up email, I'll include- um, Shauna's presentation um, and their contact information, as well as the responses to any questions that we didn't get to today. And we'll have a link to the recording. Um, And if folks wanna stick around for a little bit, we can keep the room open if people have other questions. Um, But thanks to everyone for joining us today. And thanks to Shauna, Velma and Brian for um, sharing with us. And we will look forward to seeing everyone for our next meeting in February. Um, which will focus on workforce. Um, Anna, anything else that I missed or is that everything? I think that's everyone. Thanks, everything. Thanks, everyone. (laughs) All right, everyone. Thanks for the lively discussion today and I hope everyone has a great weekend.